people talked about the Battle of Crete. Uh, this is the helmet uh, that the paratroop, German paratroop units used. Uh, extra webbing and extra connection to the face because, again, we're jumping out of planes. Michael's 100% correct. Unfortunately, uh, Hitler was very upset by the casualties. And if you study the Battle of Crete, there were a number of issues that happened. And truthfully, the Germans won that battle just by chance. The British were very poorly led. If they had been led better, uh, the Germans would not have prevailed on that particular attack. Uh, this is the standard German helmet, uh, M35, M40, uh, were the two versions that uh, came out. Uh, you recognize this probably from World War I. Towards the latter part of World War I, this was uh, pretty much the adaptation. Does not have the pickle on the top, uh, which was how the Germans first went into World War I. They changed that out. Uh, this happens to be the uh, an SS. As you know, the SS had two branches, unfortunately, the political branch and then the military branch. SS units always got the best equipment. And so, uh, again, an example, uh, this um, uh, apparatus here is simply to put some camouflage in there. Uh, for those that might remember Vietnam, the U.S. soldiers put their cigarette packs in there was an example of that. Again, very typical webbing. And then I recently acquired a French Voilu helmet. Uh, so if you want to come up and take a look at how the French approached it. Uh, unfortunately, the French between World War I and World War II, they were the victors of World War I, so they didn't necessarily need to improve their military forces to any major degree. However, uh, they did get into tank uh, uh, technology just as the English did. Uh, the Germans were well in advance of both of those countries, but nonetheless, to Michael's point, when the uh, Germans attacked uh, into France, they did meet tanks that were better than the German tanks. The Mark Ones with two machine guns, the Mark Twos with a 20 millimeter and a, a 7.92 millimeter machine gun were no match for some of the French and English tanks at the time. And so the Germans, and this is uh, the famous 88 that some of you already recognize. Uh, this was originally developed as an anti-aircraft. Uh, believe it or not, this bad boy could reach up to 35,000 feet, which was, as you know, if you're gonna fly to Europe today, you're gonna be cruising at 30 to 34,000 feet. <clears throat> and so these guys were capable of uh, going that far. I'll get out of the way. Here, uh, they found when they went into France, because some of the units that were in France had these guns, there was a very specific tractor that was designed and carriage to mount the uh, 88. It was a good sized gun. But they realized very early on that if they put this uh, <clears throat> horizontal instead of vertical, they could destroy anything. And so all of a sudden, this became the maiden of the battlefield. Again, Michael makes reference to the African campaign. This was Rommel's secret weapon. Because again, the British tanks, even though they were undergunned, they were heavier. They had armor. The Matilda was one of the very famous uh, tanks that the uh, uh, British uh, uh, Commonwealth units had in Africa. The 88 was the only thing that could destroy a Matilda. And so they were very, very dreaded. And Rommel was pretty smart. Uh, he would set up a line of 88s and he would simply bait uh, the uh, uh, Commonwealth units to attack uh, by sending out his panzers and they would then attack and the panzers would withdraw through lanes and then boom, uh, the 88 uh, batteries would open up at a thousand yards. And easily destroy the uh, UK tanks. Uh, so a tremendous, and so certainly this was the bad boy that dealt with the T-34s and the KV-1s. Uh, and, and so as Michael goes through the continuing years, we'll see the development of the 88, the development of longer barreled 75 millimeter guns, because that was the answer. Uh, I brought a standard German field telephone here. 
Hello, mother. <laughs> uh, the reason I bring this is simple. This is made, this case is made out of phenolic, which is one of the things that the Germans developed and used quite extensively. Uh, was again plastics. This is your beginning of the plastics the process. Uh, I've also brought the identification of a, a Luftwaffe uh, a pilot. And uh, I just uh, hosted a German exchange student for a half a year, and she was kind enough to uh, uh, go through this and translate it. So you can come on up and take a look at his picture. He's quite dashing and uh, has some medals. But this is exactly the translation. But this would have been very typical of the uh, uh, identification papers that you would have carried. You all recognize the potato masher. World War I, World War II style. This operates by unscrewing the bottom and there is a spring that comes out. And I've got it jammed up there pretty good. And you would pull that string, which would pull a fusing process in the head. And now you're throwing this. Now you say, okay, now that sounds pretty cool. Why didn't America adapt that? That was very simple. I grew up playing baseball. <laughs> so I'm going to throw a baseball. I didn't grow up playing with anything like this. But I grew up throwing a baseball as fast as I possibly could. So now I'm going to pull a pin with my teeth, let that lever flash, and I'm going to toss that. Uh, so we can always run a contest of how far you can throw one of these versus a pineapple, which is all pineapple for any but. Uh, it also depended on your arm strength and so on and so forth. Uh, there's a book over there that's open to a page of the uh, that's Barbarossa, and it's got a bunch, picture of a bunch of Russian soldiers, and this is what they're armed with. This is the famous PPSH-41, uh, developed in 1941, and uh, very interesting. You might recognize something about this gun, and that's this round magazine. Well, let's talk about the 1930s Chicago. Yeah, no. What do we remember about that period in that city? Mm -hmm. Thompson submachine gun with round uh, a drum magazine. Unfortunately, in the hands of bootleggers and other criminals, and I hate all that thought, but nonetheless, interestingly, World War II, the American units did not stay with the Thompson with the drum magazine for many reasons. Number one, the noise it made, because those rounds would bounce around inside of here. Number two, the weight of carrying them. Here is the pouch that I would have, and I've got just straps on the back, so it would have hooked to my belt as a Russian soldier. Uh, but the Russians developed this. Now, this actually is a real gun here, everybody, but it was, I bought it cut. It was cut in several places. That's how, that's how I own it in New York State. And I sent it to a group in Nevada that re-welded it and painted it, but the bolt and all the mechanism is no longer there. Uh, the barrel is full, is full, so it does not work. But nonetheless, this is an actual PPSH-41 uh, that's been uh, uh, demilled so that I, here in wonderful New York State, can own it. And you're talking about that towards the component of the caliber. Uh, this is 7.62 so around. Uh, you know, these are all 9 millimeter. The Americans had the 45, uh, which was, by the way, a very slow round. Um, but nonetheless, it had pretty good hitting power. Right. In a in, in terms of caliber, which was a different measurement, it's roughly a 30 caliber. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to a 50 caliber, which is a half inch round. So again, 90 millimeter. So this is the famous Schmeisser uh, German. You all have seen these. These have been around for lots of time, lots of years. Uh, they originally came out as the MP38, which was a machine version. And then they came out in MP40 in 1940 with more of a stamped version, less expensive uh, to produce. But uh, this is as famous. Uh, you can still find these in use today in certain criminal elements. It's very, very reliable uh, folding stock. Um, an, an interesting story about Barbarossa. When the Germans arrive in this war and begin the process of uh, fighting, they are up against the PPSH-41 very soon after they get there. 
This only had a 30 round magazine. The PPSH has a 70 round drum. And so the German units went back to the headquarters and said, hey, we have a problem on the battlefield. We only, we're running out of ammunition well before the Russian soldiers. And the Russians simply, in my view, were very, very effective for two reasons. Number one, they didn't care about human life. Sorry, but we even see that today in Ukraine. But the other thing was they mass produced guns like this and gave them to the soldiers with very little training and they simply would attack on the back of tanks because they didn't have horses or trucks like the Germans did. So they'd ride in the back of tanks. When they got within range, they'd jump off and they were simply sitting there pulling the trigger because they had 70 rounds. They were just simply sending lead at the German units, the German line at a much, much higher rate than the Germans were able to send back. Yeah, so. Just to give you an idea, just think of numbers, all right? Let's say you have five guys on the back of a tank and they jump off and they pull the trigger. It's 350 rounds. Think of arrows, all right? If you just want an example of what's coming at you, all right? And only it's a lot faster and deadlier. Now, now those are pistol rounds rather than yes. rifle rounds. Correct. So they're going to be relatively short range. Yeah. So yep. you're, the, the, the accuracy of these weapons in meters is 100 to 200 meters. So you got a football field that, okay. you're, that, you're, that you're essentially aiming. Now, remember, the American Revolution, shoulder to shoulder, 50 to 100 yards, how much lead can we send at the enemy versus aiming? Mm -hmm. You got the same thing here. You're not aiming these guns, essentially, unless it's very, very you're simply pulling the trigger and lobbying all that lead at the enemy line as best as possible. Mm -hmm. So one of the things the Germans came up with, which we saw the Americans adopt, was simply to tape a couple of magazines together in different configurations so they could immediately release it and slide the other one in, mm -hmm. as opposed to having to take the time to go into a, uh, you know, a, a cartridge box type arrangement like that. And so that was one of the ways that, that they dealt. The problem with that is you've got one or two of these clips with the bullets, the actual rounds exposed. And so now dirts and mud, anything else could have gotten in there. So that wasn't quite the answer to it. Um, as I mentioned, this is the standard pairing case for more of these. Uh, this is the, the CAR 98K, which was the standard bolt action Mauser that was issued to German troops. Uh, five round clip. And so, this World War I, World War II would have been very, very typical of the cartridge box. Again, it has a ring clip or a belt clip uh, so that you would attach here, uh, held together at the bottom. Uh, this is the standard nice, neat cleaning kit for a car 98K. I'm not going to pull out all the pieces, but again, very simple, uh, easy to clean the gun. Uh, again, bolt action. America goes to war with the M1 Grand, which is an eight round semi automatic. It's interesting because once the Germans detect guns of that nature, and including the Russians that had the SVT, which was a semi automatic weapon, the Germans go back, and again, latter part of Michael's discussion, I'm sure, the Germans begin to develop the semi-automatic weapons, basically copying what they're seeing in Russia and what the Americans come to war with. Uh, this is a standard a map case uh, for the German forces. Uh, this is as actual as it gets. And uh, so this bad boy opens up. And when I bought this piece, it actually had some leftover pens. So I want to see some leftover pens and pencils uh, from German units. And it also had a very interesting uh, measuring device. You can come on up and take a look. Uh, there's a level here in graduations, and it's a sighting process. A very, very small hole here. And so, again, I haven't figured out exactly how to use it. And the guy's name is printed on the back side of that. So mm -hmm. you can come up and take a look at that. Uh, 
I also have, um, and the next time that we're together, I have other toys that mm -hmm. I'll bring, one of which will be an MG-34, the actual machine gun of, of the German units developed in 34. And this is one of the 50 round magazines, Africa Corps. There's an Africa Corps piece right there. Uh, but this hooked on the side of the machine gun. And again, now they had a 50 round use of uh, the, instead of carrying a belt or here's the standard MG-34, MG-42. This was the standard uh, uh, ammunition box of the Wehrmacht during the war. Uh, painted the standard of Vermont green, a little bit different than the American version. Some of you have probably seen the American version, but it's so, somewhat similar. Uh, Michael talks about the 76.2 millimeter uh, uh, cannon uh, anti-tank weapon that the Russians use. This is the actual site, gunner site for one of those. Hmm. You can come on up later and look through that and see exactly how it was graduated, just pointed at the light. You can see exactly what the gunner was looking at, uh, various controls. This is the same thing, but this is the German 105 millimeter howitzer uh, gunner's sight. Again, you can come on up and take a look and see exactly what the gunner was looking at and how he figured out the sighting process for that. Uh, this is the 105 millimeter howitzer uh, propellant charge. Different than this round here, which you can see is integral. You have a warhead on the top. Again, Michael mentioned different styles. You could have armor piercing, you could have high explosive, uh, different types of armor piercing, and then the standard propellant shell, all one contained item. Howitzers, on the other hand, had a warhead and then a propellant uh, casing. And so this is an actual 105 millimeter howitzer propellant. Can you show us the bottom of that? You can line up and take that's okay. the primer. That's the primer. The primer right there. And it's marked, it's dating and the, and the uh, Lofted marking on it. Uh, along with that, this is the wood and metal carriage that the Germans developed. And this would carry the warhead. So again, if I pop this off of here, which I can, this 105 millimeter version would be sitting inside of this. So when we talk about transportation, whether it's horse drawn or truck, imagine that for every 105 millimeter howitzer, there had to be hundreds of these in a truck or drawn some way along with the gun itself to the point of use. Okay. And so this is an actual piece. Now, you might say to me, well, where are you finding all this crazy stuff? Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I'm finding all this crazy stuff from various contacts in the Ukraine. Wow, wow. Estonia, I bought huh. This helmet came from Russia before the Ukrainian war. Huh. Now you can't. can't get that stuff. The eBay has shut down huh. Russia. So... Uh, so again, now I go to various gun shows and you can find this stuff, but I happen to enjoy eBay uh, because again, it's supporting individuals as opposed to corporations. But, uh, so there are other things. So again, uh, the next time uh, we host this and for all of you that are at home, uh, come on in uh, because uh, I've got other toys that I will bring. <laughs> Uh, I didn't bring everything today because I didn't want to spoil it. I want to save something for another another uh, adventure. But, uh, so yes, I do. Thanks, George. Really I nice appreciate that. So we could borrow a couple of those and head to a bank and finance the, the rest of the <laughs> program. Like that. All right, because part of all of this truly is just fun too. I mean, you know, we could try to be serious about a lot of different things, and I do try to do that, but. At the same time, this is such a treat to be able to actually see what's there. And for those of you who are really, really interested, you can go down to Florida and there's a place there near Orlando that actually will allow you to take a ride in a tank. <laughs> Can you Wouldn't that be something? awesome? <laughs> yeah. uh, Michael, let me just take a quick minute. Regarding yes. that, forget Florida. 
It's not the time of year to be in Florida. It's wonderful here. The air is so fresh. <laughs> I recently, two weeks ago, visited an absolutely phenomenal museum that I would like Michael to go with me. It's called the American Heritage Museum. It's this side of Boston. So for all of you that have driven on the Mass Turnpike and taken 495 South to get to Cape Cod, right? instead of taking 495 South, take 495 North, and within 30 minutes of leaving the Mass Turnpike, you could be at the door of this location. They have a KV-1, they have a T-34, they have a Panther, they have a Mark IV, they have a Hetzer, which is a German anti-tank tank. And everything else, they have a Scud missile launcher there. Right? It's, <laughs> it is a phenomenal place, uh, American Heritage Museum. Okay. Look it up and take a look at what they've got there. It's a phenomenal museum. Great place. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. <laughs> now, as we've talked about, the arrangement to attack Russia was a very, very complicated affair. We haven't even scratched the surface, but just as a way of thinking about something, think of how much equipment is destroyed during the course of any fighting, all of which has to be replaced. You have to get leather. That means you have to have an access to leather. Wood. You think, well, how hard is it? Except that it becomes hard to come by when you're consuming vast amounts of this in a very short period of time. This all plays a role into what's happening in Ukraine and Crimea, for example. And access to resources, remember, was one of the reasons why Hitler launched an attack against Russia, was resources. When we look at the end of Barbarossa, which just goes up to December of 41, the amount of territory lost by Russia is phenomenal. And all of the resources that were there in Ukraine, in Belarus, in the Baltic states, in that eastern part of Russia, western part of Russia, are lost. They're gone. But you also have to develop those resources and bring them back. So there's a time constraint with all of this. And Germany is on the short end of that logistical stick. This gives you an idea quickly of just how the organization was to take place and what happened within the first month. One of the important elements to look at is just how much was covered within a relatively short period of time. I'm not going to deal with this too much. I just want you to see as an overview what kind of things happened from June 22nd just into July. Now, the rapid advance that takes place is considerable. Now remember that what I talked about was how comparably German tanks were inferior to Russian tanks, not only in terms of quality, but in terms of number. The numbers in fact were vastly in favor of the Russians. So why did this happen? How, did, how could it happen when your guns won't even take out a KV? There are stories that you can read in histories about how a KV tank is literally sitting for a couple of days at a crossroads while the Germans are trying to take it out because they haven't been able to bring up the 88 to get it. It's just sitting there. Okay. The point for all of this, therefore, is that what was most vital was capturing or destroying Russian armies on the frontier. And in order to do this, you had to have rapid penetration of the frontier. Infantry can only walk so far, and that's uncontested. <laughs> if you're contested, an advance of five to 10 miles is considered an enormous achievement. But this was not sufficient if you wanted to get behind the Russian first <laughs> echelon forces. Armor, on the other hand, once a breach was made in the defenses, <clears throat> could penetrate more deeply. But that would be on a fine thread of logistical support because tanks consume fuel. And you have to have plenty of fuel coming up on a regular basis in order to get there. What brings fuel? Tankers, right? 
Are they armored? No, they're very flammable as a matter of fact. So you have to protect them. You have to set up all of this intricate stuff in order to be able to even support the armor moving forward. And then armor is insufficient to cut off or completely surround a, uh, an enemy force. You need the infantry. So when the infantry begins to attack German tanks, it becomes a real Donnybrook of a fight. And again, there are many descriptions if you read through histories of this conflict as to how terrible that fighting could be. Stalin also, in the beginning, did not want any of his troops to retreat. Initially, and historians differ a little bit on this point, it's said that Stalin, though he had been warned by the British that the Germans were going to attack, thought that this was British disinformation. Mm -hmm. Have we heard that word? All right. So he tended to ignore it. And as a result, when it happened, some historians relate that he actually was so overwhelmed by what was happening that he didn't even issue orders for almost a couple of days. And then he finally went on public address. There is some question about the truthfulness of that, but it's an important element to keep in mind that even someone like Stalin, whom most of us would characterize as a real psychopath, mm -hmm. and, I, and I say that sort of medically speaking, <laughs> right? Uh, because of his attitude towards things, uh, he still could suffer an emotional collapse of some sort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Important in this is to notice that there are two German army groups headed in this direction. Here's Moscow way over here, right? This is the main road, probably, oh, sort of like an Autobahn, but not quite as big. And all the other roads that are being used are nothing more really than dirt tracks. And as you get near the coast, it becomes very difficult because of a lot of creeks, streams, marshes, rivers that had broadened out as they reach the Baltic and the Gulf of Finland and so on. So the impetus to move forward here is very, very difficult. And as a result of their understanding, the Germans concentrated most of their armor in Army Group Center. Army Group North had one panzer group Army Group South, which had an enormous distance to go, only had one panzer group as well. Notice the Pripyat marshes, that there's really no attack through there. They have to go around it. Russian units did retreat into here when they were in danger of being encircled, uh, and they launched partisan attacks later on. What about the fighting itself? <clears throat> well, Brutality is a normal in war, but this reached a different level of brutality. And if you look at differences between how the Germans treated the French and British and American prisoners of war compared to how they treated the Russian prisoners of war, or conversely, how the Russians treated German prisoners of war, you find a very, very different dynamic. Why? because this fight was an ideological fight. The fight against Britain and France in the United States was not really as ideological, not based on a concept of immutable truth, the way it was between Russia and Germany. In addition, race played a huge part. Slavs were untermenken. They were inferior people. They were to be enslaved and eventually eliminated. They had no purpose other than to serve the Germans as long as they lived, and then at that point, get rid of them. So this kind of approach also developed in the Pacific War for slightly different reasons. I'm not going to go into here because we're talking about this particular part of the conflict. But it's important to understand that the destructiveness that took place on the Eastern Front was considerably greater than what was seen in the Western Front later on. Now, although this is a late picture, 
it demonstrates a particular concept that Stalin was offering. And that was that you couldn't leave anything for the Germans to use. The term that was applied was scorched earth. That had been used in previous conflicts. For example, when Napoleon invaded Russia, Tsar Alexander used the concept of scorched earth. Don't leave anything for the French, all right? Now, I want to just emphasize again, a very quick quotation of the directive that Hitler was giving to his troops as they were to engage in this fight. The German armed forces must make preparations to crush Soviet Russia in a lightning campaign, even before the termination of hostilities with Great Britain. For this purpose, the army will commit all available forces, except those needed to safeguard the occupied territories against surprise attack. During the initial phase, the bulk of Russian army is to be destroyed by armored thrusts. The organized withdrawal of intact units into the vastness of interior Russia must be prevented. Now notice he was aware of the vastness. People somehow, when they write about this, think they didn't pay attention to any of this. They knew what the problems were and how to, they best could overcome them. During the next phase, a fast pursuit will be launched up to a line from which the Russian Air Force will be incapable of attacking German territory. Now, remember that I said earlier, in a situation like this, Moscow was not initially mentioned as the goal. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit when we move on. All right. Now, <clears throat> I talked about logistics. And I talked about the movements forward. Here are a couple of the pockets that are formed and we'll talk more about those as we go. But what we're seeing here is that on July 21, right, just a month after the attack occurs, the Germans have penetrated deeply into Russian territory. Think now about what happened, for example, in the first Gulf War, if any of you have spent any time looking at just the conflict itself and how rapidly the United States and other allied units penetrated the uh, Iraqi defenses and basically destroyed them. But then look at Crimea, I'm sorry, Ukraine and Russia now. And if you go back and look at maps from February, leaving out what happened around Kiev, because right, we're not going down that road just yet, but even around Kharkiv and Kherson, where the Russians withdrew, for months, that front line has moved very, very little. Maybe a couple of miles here and there, right? This is modern warfare, allegedly. And notice that in June to July of 1941, the Germans have penetrated well over 100 miles against 3 million Russians, armed and equipped, allegedly trained, but they were not, to fight. In fact, some of those heavy tanks went into battle without any ammunition. So they just ran over guns and pushed tanks and vehicles off the road. <clears throat> but think of the sacrifice of the soldiers doing that. They know they're not coming home. The first major encirclement takes place around the city of Minsk. You can't see it well from where you are. But in this particular area, you have remnants of two Soviet armies. And you are looking at perhaps as many as 200,000 soldiers. 200,000. Think about that for a minute. How many did we lose in 20 years of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan? And how did we feel about that as an American people? This occurs within a couple weeks. And this is only one part of the front. The German army would press ahead as much as 60 miles. There's Minsk. But they would keep going once 
they can allow the infantry to catch up. The infantry has to actually reduce the pocket. There are thousands in here of armed Russians who are thinking, I got to get out of Dodge. How is it that they couldn't get out? Because doctrine and communications were so disrupted that units could not organize themselves. Well, we talked about how superior Russian tanks were. Why didn't they just overwhelm the German spearheads? Couple of very quick deficiencies. One is that compartments in the T-34, for example, were somewhat cramped. Visibility was limited. It was very rudimentary. There's no air conditioning, all right? It's hot. You're in a metal box. You have no radio. That's the one. Whereas the Germans' tanks all had radios. Why does that matter? Because then you could coordinate an assault. You could say, listen, we can't take those guys head on. There's an open flank. Go around and get them from the rear where their armor is easily penetrated, even with our small caliber weapons. Okay, armor leads the way. Deep thrusts are to keep exactly what Hitler wanted. Don't let intact units retreat. Cut them off, destroy them. This is what's necessary if we're going to win. And this again shows that just for example, at this one site of Dubno, Army Group South, which is attacking towards Kiev, but can't get there because they don't have the power to overcome the Russian defenses, which were particularly strong in this part of Ukraine. <clears throat> They had to drive through a considerable distance. Now, what I want to show you, and the reason this is here is not that you're going to get quizzed on the drive on Dubno, mm -hmm. all right? This is beginning the day after they've penetrated the frontier. They're already headed for the rear of the Russian forces. But what's important, the Russians are here, the Russians are here, the Russians are here. Look at how narrow this is. Look at the scale of miles, the distance from here to here. You launch an attack up this way and this way, these guys are now encircled, cut off from fuel. Mm -hmm. Think of the danger, the risk that's involved. How is it that the Germans could allow them to take that risk? Doctrine and training. They could let junior officers make critical decisions instantaneously. They were given a mission, they weren't told exactly how to do it. They were trained to be trusted to make the right decisions to allow this to happen. And as a result, these penetrations would disrupt the Russians who were poorly coordinated. And in spite of these being their frontline troops, whom you think would represent some of their best troops initially, but they could penetrate these distances, look at the distance from here to here, look at the scale of miles, and you begin to appreciate exactly what this represents. Now, <clears throat> as you see the attack develop, you see this bulge sticking out here. And the importance of this bulge is that the Germans are driving in this direction and they're driving in this direction. These guys are holding up those German forces from advancing. This was not necessarily intentional on the German part. But as you get to August and you see this development, it raises a set of critical decisions that have to be made. And they can only be made by the top person who is Hitler. And what does that involve? This particular decision has been criticized by historians and by contemporary German generals who fought this campaign, saying that this was the critical mistake Hitler made in conducting Operation Barbarossa. Remember, Barbarossa was designed to reach a line far to the east to keep 
Russian bombers from being able to attack Germany or Palestine. Okay, mm -hmm. so what's going on? <clears throat> this particular area in front of Kiev is on the right flank of Army Group Center, the most powerful unit that's driving straight for Moscow. The Russian forces are falling apart in front of Army Group Center. It's making enormous progress towards Moscow. But as that line continues in this direction, you have this huge number of Russians on your right flank. What are you going to do about them? You're going to leave them there? Are the Russians dumb enough to say, oh, we're not going to do anything. We'll just sort of sit here and defend. Or are you going to muster what forces you can and drive into that flank and cut off those German spearheads that are headed for Moscow? There are hundreds of thousands of Russians there. This isn't a small collection, OK? And what's the other reason that you were fighting this? Resources, terrain and resources in that terrain. So can you leave that under Russian control? My interpretation, contrary to many historians, is that Hitler made the right decision to divert a panzer group from Army Group Center down into the northern flank of this bulge and to have another panzer group attack from the south, hopefully meet up here and create a pocket. Now remember, they didn't know the outcome of this war. When they completed that encirclement, there were roughly 600,000 caught in the pocket. Think of that. This is early in the war. You had over 200,000 outside Minsk. There were other pockets where there were slightly smaller numbers. You had 3 million soldiers allegedly on your front line in your first echelon. And now within a month, you've lost over 30%. What do you have left to put in there? What nation, what political entity could tolerate that kind of loss in that short a period of time and continue fighting. France collapsed within weeks. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, the Germans didn't occupy all of France, right? They basically got down to Paris and said, we'll take the rest of France unless you surrender. And what did the French say? Okay, we're done. You look at the casualty rates for the German campaign against the French, it's not like this, not within a short period of time. But for each person on that front, Russian or German or Romanian or Hungarian or Italian, the strain and stress of combat is enormous. And even for Ivan, the physical demands, the emotional demands, even though in terms of their society, it was considered more primitive. And again, I'm gonna give you a, an interesting thing I just heard on the news the other day. Do you know that 30% of Russian homes still use outhouses? Mm -hmm. wow. As though that's a problem. Oh, they're inferior. Look how decrepit their economy is. Well, maybe using an outhouse toughens you. Maybe it gets you used to being out when the weather's bad. 
and you learn how to survive in it. Whereas if you've got a nice warm heated seat on your toilet, <laughs> and now you go got to drop your trow in a snowbank, maybe you're a little more uncomfortable. Small points, but they're ones that I think we need to keep in mind. Now, I show this because numbers help, but numbers deceive. You know that old Mark Twain saying, you know, there are lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. Mm -hmm. Okay. But why is this, why does this matter? It matters in part because of this number you'll see over here. <clears throat> This is 22nd of June. Now notice, all right, 170 infantry divisions. Notice 21 August. Where the hell did that come from? How did that happen? I just told you that they lost at least a third of their frontline troops within a very short time of the onset of the fight up to mid-July. Where did that come from? So in terms of what we're seeing, the resiliency that we were seeing in Russia as this conflict broke out was extraordinary. It was beyond anything the world had ever seen before. Anything the world had ever seen. And remember also, that if you're surrounded and captured, as far as your country's concerned, you may as well be dead. Mm -hmm. You are no longer an asset. Mm -hmm. If you're wounded, we might be able to get you back on the battlefield or find a job for you in the rear where you can manufacture something or be productive in some way. But if you're captured, it's as though you're dead. Mm -hmm. And indeed, over 90% of Russian POWs died in captivity. Another number that we find appalling. This gives you an idea, though, with just a short period of time, right, two months and a week, wounded in action, missing in action, killed. Now, this particular set of numbers again, show you that out of an army of 3 million Germans, they were looking at 10%. Now, when you look at combat efficiency, and there's a lot of discussion in military uh, writings about this, when you get to 10%, you're beginning to get very shaky in your combat efficiency. And when you get to 20%, you can be considered nearly combat ineffective, meaning basically, you're done fighting as a coordinated unit. And at 30%, it's over. You don't have to lose 50, 60, 70% to be combat ineffective. But here's another part. This is what you've lost, okay? And you're getting replacements. Oops. 217 to compensate for 400,000. So you're not replacing as the Germans, you're not replacing your combat losses. Your population's much smaller than that of Russia. The Russian number of divisions, though they're smaller than German divisions, but just the number as identified as divisions had gone up. The German number of soldiers on the front line had dropped. And that says nothing about all the other stuff that goes along with it. Army Group South, and you see here this bulge developing that I talked about, here's Kiev here, had made some uh, progress by the end of August with another encirclement here. That's different from this encirclement and some of the others. And I'll finish up fairly soon here so you can just begin to see, sorry the kind of advances that were made by the Germans from mid to late August, but actually back here is where the start line is, right? So 
June 22nd, interestingly, I think that was the very anniversary of the day in which Napoleon attacked Russia in 1812, <clears throat> right? Uneven advances, exposed flank, Pripyat marshes. What are you going to do to prevent the Russians from counterattacking on your flanks? You have to destroy them in place. The prime goal that was outlined at the very beginning of Operation Barbarossa. And as, oh, sorry, again, going the wrong way with this. A bit more complex map, but again, don't worry about the details. The bulge here is going to be a problem for the Germans if they leave it unresolved because their ultimate target, according to some of the German generals, is there, Moscow. What's going to happen? And in addition, the Germans are getting up close to Leningrad. But here is the ultimate question, and we'll stop at this point. And I want you just to think about it for a moment because we have some historical evidence to suggest what would happen, both at the time of this particular fight, but also historical. Would Russia surrender if Moscow fell? The German generals insisted that that would be the case. The armaments manufacturing, the network of roads was such that taking Moscow would collapse Russian resistance. At the time, the Russians did not feel that way. They didn't want to lose Moscow. They were going to expend enormous resources in order to protect it. But they weren't talking about capitulation if Moscow fell. What other example do we have? Napoleon took Moscow in 1812. Did Russia surrender? No. Kept fighting. So the idea that Russia would surrender may indeed just be a pipe dream. And the issues confronting Hitler at the time were that maybe Moscow wasn't really all that critical, though it would be nice to have it. Now, Hitler makes a fundamental mistake in 42 related to something like that, which we will get into at a much later date. But in terms of this particular fight right now through the summer of 41, it's pretty clear that the resistance that Russians are offering is not likely to collapse if Moscow goes under. And we'll talk about Leningrad and the others uh, at our next time. I will be happy to stay as long as any of you wish. I have over here a board map of the terrain, you can kind of get an idea of at least what things look like. This is the Pacific area, which we have obviously haven't touched on today, but we'll get to hopefully sometime later in the lecture series. I thank you for your patience and tolerance, and I want to thank George again for an extraordinary display of things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't recognize you. We can't go on meeting like this. I know.